Hi, my name is Saul Cold, and one of my favorite things is when traveling for for business. I love um, hunting for sneakers or vintage toys in any city I may end up in. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome back to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones. It's Monday, July 5th, but it feels like a Sunday, and so this week's episode is coming to you a little bit late. I have been, as you heard last week, (laughs) I got up at 7 in the morning, edited a podcast, got in my car, and started a week-long road trip. I went from Chicago to Michigan to out to New York City, where I met up with my dad, and then did the return trip, got to Chicago yesterday, um, and editing this inter- interview with Saul Colt just didn't make my to-do list, sadly. Um, didn't mean I wasn't thinking about you. So I hope you will accept this uh, day late, but not a dollar short episode. I'm also getting ready to dive into a bit of a health thing. Uh, I spoke about a few weeks ago about doing all that deferred maintenance get your mammograms, do your annual physicals, um, check in with your doctors. And so some of my tests did their job and I've going to be spending part of this summer in and out of doctor's offices a lot. Um, nothing that is life threatening at the moment because I found it early. Um, and I will say more about it in future episodes. Um, but if you listen to the interview last week with Max and you're like, whoa, Leah has a weird energy. Um, it's because about three hours before I talked to Max, um, I had gotten this diagnosis. And so I was um, trying to keep it together to do my podcast, um, but also talking to someone completely new to me. Um, so I would just was pretending like things were totally normal. Um This interview with Saul Colt happened, I don't know, we talked like at least a month ago, Um, but it's fun. We talk about the Tomorrow War, which came out this week. I've seen about half of it um, with one of my favorite podcasters, Mike Mitchell's in it. We talk about travel and going to thrift stores and collectibles and sneakers and toys and vintage toys and road trips. And this is just a really fun hang uh, with me and my friend Saul. New York was fantastic. Uh, My dad had a few things on his list. Uh, Pastrami, which we did okay with. Hobby's Deli in Newark, New Jersey is closed and redeveloping their site. And so I didn't get to, somehow we didn't get to like a really good place for pastrami. We did go to Gallagher's for, to share a porterhouse steak. And that was truly the best steak I've ever put in my body. Uh, We went to the Poster House Museum in Chelsea, which has an outstanding exhibit about Klinger right now. Do check that out. We went to the Eden Gallery, the Pickle Guys, Super Chief. We had a moment where we thought that the art that we'd come to collect uh, might find a home in New York. Uh, That did not happen, but boy, was it fun to like have some serious conversations with the, the fine folks at Super Chief. They were so cool. Um, and nice to us and took us seriously. Um, and then I drove cross country with six porcelain sculptures and made it home to my parents' house in Indiana, safe and sound. And then came back and for the 4th of July in Chicago, had a couple of friends over and the Winnemac Park fireworks were just, uh, there were rumors <laughs> that it wasn't happening this year. And those rumors were not true. And it was really stressful. Normally, I lock myself in my bedroom with my cats. And I tell myself it's for my cats. And this year, I was hanging out with friends in the backyard around a campfire. um, And uh, realized that I locked myself in my room with the cats for myself. Because these amateur firework shows are very stressful and very loud. Um... They do at least wrap up pretty much at 11. Um, That I appreciate, but boy, do they go on forever. Um, 
So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, get those doctor's appointments scheduled, friends. We got through COVID. Some of us got through COVID. Um, and we've got to put other health health things in the front of mind. It's not just now avoiding catching COVID and spreading it. It is now about like everything else that's happening in your body. So get on, get, you know, go schedule a checkup, get your mammograms, get your EKGs, whatever your regular battery of tests are and uh, take care of yourself and keep enjoying your favorite things. Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we get recommendations without using an algorithm. I am back today with one of my earliest guests. Uh, His name is Saul Colt. He is the smartest man in the world, founder and creative director of the Idea Integration Company. He is the host of the podcast. We now joined the program Already in Progress uh, coming live from Toronto, I think. Although you're wearing a Montreal hat, so now I'm no. J- I'm in Toronto. I just like the hat. Okay. <laughs> I had a moment. I had a seizure. Uh, so coming to us live from Toronto is Saul Colt. Saul, how are you doing tonight? I, I, I'm really good, and I'm so grateful that you had me back on the show. Not only because you're a dear friend, and I like catching up with you, but I'm like a really easy podcast get. And a lot of people have me like in their first three, four episodes, and then the thing takes off and nobody goes back to listen to those early ones and even knows I was on the show. So now that you're, you've taken the podcast world by storm, yes. um, I hope that my returning on the show will get me discovered. Your return to the show will get you discovered. It's, I'm going to give you a better sound edit. So like the sound has improved. That's, some, that's something I'm really proud of. There were... I, I, you, I, uh, to go under the hood, I have been editing an Adobe audition the whole time. Adobe audition has a podcast template that I thought just said, put your vocal tracks here, put your music here, put your intro here. What I didn't realize was the template also was applying filters and equalizers. Like it had a plan. It had an algorithm for what it was doing. Mm -hmm. And then I was I was then adding filters on top of filters I didn't know what were there. And so once I realized that the sound, the audio quality has improved. So I'm happy to have you back because you'll sound better under this version of Leah Jones editing. I think I'm better at having a conversation on mic than I was when we talked. And uh, I'm just thrilled to have you back. Oh, well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Is it, are you starting to feel summer up in Toronto? Um, you know what? The weather has finally turned, which is really nice. Um, you know, I've been like most people been stuck in my house for, you know, probably 15, 16 months mm-hmm. now. We're not fully out of COVID yet. Um, so in the States, I know a bunch of places are sort of back to the way it was. We're, we're still in kind of like a weird gray zone where um, the majority of Canadians have not had their second vaccination yet. Um, I got mine two days ago and, and I had the nastiest reaction to it. I'm still sweating, yeah. running a low grade fever. So if I faint um, during our conversation, it's not you, it's, it's, it's my vaccination. But, um, but I will say like uh, as much as I miss people and I miss traveling and I miss all the things we're going to talk about. Um, I have, you know, now that the weather's nice and last summer I lived in my backyard. I, I, you know, the Pompadoro method where you're supposed to like take these 15 minute breaks, like work 25, take a 15 work 25. Yeah. So I don't believe in any of that productivity stuff, but I am doing two 15 minute, like just hardcore sun tanning sessions in my backyard. Outstanding. two a day where I, I, I'm, I'm out there just in a pair of shorts. I literally set the timer on my phone and no, no lotion or anything. I'm going, I, I want to be like honey brown um, by like, you know, July. And um, man, nothing is better than, than sunlight. 
it was really it's starting to make a huge difference here as mm-hmm. well. Like being able to, you know, we did in my, I live in a, in a building with seven apartments. We, we did fire pits all winter and we are just, we're doing now two or three fire pits a week of just mm. hanging out in the backyard. You know, we are allowed to go out and socialize and go to bars and stuff, but we found out like we like each other. And so we just try to get our friends to come over to the backyard Uh mm-hmm. And, and I also have found that I don't, I'm still in COVID social brain where like, mm-hmm. I'm just not thinking about making plans and people ask to do things. And I'm like, oh, right, we can do that now. But I, I'm like, well, but I have a Zoom tonight. No, mm-hmm. I've got a Zoom. Like, I still have so many online plans and, mm-hmm. and things to do in my house. So I have found, although even though we're allowed to do like indoor dining and if you're mass, if you're vaxxed, you don't have to mask. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm wearing, I am still wearing my mask. I'm going to stick with the mask for a while. Because it has been nice other than my COVID reaction to be healthy for a year and a half. Like I have really enjoyed that. It turns out. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny. The only thing I miss is, is people. Um, but kind of, I don't miss the traffic. I don't miss the commute. I don't miss mm. any of that stuff. I just like, I miss, miss friends and people and, and like as wonderful as Zoom is and it, it did fill a gap. Um, definitely like, you know, the sort of like the top five, um, sort of rise, rose to the top and you stayed in touch and mm-hmm. people that you still really care about, but just, you know, sort of, you didn't, didn't reach out or whatever like that. That's the, one of the more unfortunate things about COVID. Yeah. It's hard to, cause I, I have a whole social circle in Chicago of people that there's like three parties a year we see each other at, mm-hmm. right. There's a Halloween party, there's my Hanukkah party. And then there's probably a summer, you know, like a, a summer something. Yeah. And, and, and that keeps you going at a certain level. And it has, it's really weird not to have those, acquaintanceships or incidental I you know one of the things I love most in the world because I was raised watching cheers is I love being a regular I love knowing a bartender I love knowing a barista I love knowing like a hotel concierge and to have a whole year of not being a regular anywhere that's I miss I really miss that it's funny you say that because one of the things I was thinking about the other day is I like I'm in no hurry to run back to restaurants. Mm-hmm. I don't miss the restaurant experience, but there are dishes that I have missed over yeah. the last year from places that I really love. And, and, and so it's funny, like I don't miss being waited on, but man, like the best pizza in the city is, at, is like, a 45 minute drive that won't deliver to my house, but it was well worth that once every two months, special trip down there and stuff like that. So tell me more about that pizza place, place called Famosa. It's a Neapolitan pizza. I don't know. I've had Neapolitan at a bunch of places. And for some reason, this place just nails it every single time. Have they got the big wood fire pizza, like that, like 500 degree crazy oh. everything authentic yeah and it's like all the tables are in like a sort of a half moon around mm-hmm. the oven so and like it takes like 45 seconds to make a pizza because the thing is like so hot that they just they put it in they basically just like what the minute it starts like melting the cheese they yank it out and it's uh it's everything's just uh it's good that is that sounds amazing mm-hmm uh, what else? What are some other dishes either in Toronto or in, you know, L.A., New York? You've got some places you regularly travel to. I am. I've been daydreaming about L.A. a lot lately Yeah. Um, for food and for toys and collectible hunting and things like that. But um, L.A. is maybe my favorite place in North America. And it's funny. I have been to L.A., I'm not even exaggerating when I say probably 60 to 80 times over the last decade Mm -hmm. for work trips and things like that. And I'd say the first 20 times I was there, I hated every minute of my time in L.A. And then I made friends. What happened, friends? 
Well, I made friends and then like I was no longer eating at like the Cheesecake Factory. They were taking me to like cool places and right. neighborhood places and the whole city was opened up to me. And like, man, when I think of L.A., I think of Cantor's, you know, and when people yeah. say people like so many people think of like, oh, you got to get off the plane, go right to In-N-Out. I think yeah. In-N-Out's OK. Yeah, but the I, fries are cool before you from before you get them to your mouth. Yeah, I don't like the fries. I didn't know, but the burgers are okay. But man, if I'm hungry, my first stop is always Cantor's. I stay in a hotel close to Cantor's just so I can go to Cantor's. Um, L.A., Fairfax and Sunset, the Griddle Cafe. Okay. Is the best pancake place in the world. And it's one of these places that have like 1700 different ways to make a pancake. Ooh. And they've got a red velvet pancake. That's basically just a cupcake. It's the most delicious thing. And you can get like bananas and this and that, like anything you can think of in a pancake. And um, the griddle cafe is awesome because the food's great. Prices are, are normal. It's like a neighborhood place. It's popular, but it's like not, you know, like it's not crazy, but um Almost every time I go, I've seen a celebrity there, mm -hmm. and I love. I love like you love a celebrity run in. I just love. I, I love anything kitschy and dopey. Yeah. So, um, so I'll tell you, the last time I was there was like I don't know, two years ago or whatever. Uh, Chris Pratt was sitting by himself at the like. There's there's seats, and then there's like a like a bar banquet yeah. area where they they see the singles and he was there and he was just minding his business he was eating some pancakes and some bacon and he had his hat pulled down tight mm -hmm. and i was alone too and i was sitting next to chris pratt but there was an empty seat between us mm -hmm. because i believe that you you know like when you're when you're eating alone you should respect kind of like urinal rules you don't go right shoulder to shoulder yep. with somebody you give somebody a little space for that thing and i didn't realize it was chris pratt until i sat down and um it was it was just really funny once i kind of realized it was pratt I didn't talk to him. I wanted to give him his face, but I tried to take like a sneaky selfie where both of us <laughs> were in the frame and he kind of noticed it as I was taking it. And he gave like, he gave me like a little, little smirk for the picture and then just went back to his food. Cause he realized I probably wasn't going to kill him. And, yeah. uh, and then he just, he paid his bill and he left through the back door. And for some reason, I just thought that was like the coolest thing ever. That is, that's fun. And yeah. he's got a movie coming out, the tomorrow war. Mm -hmm. He, um, man, did that guy become like one of the biggest deals in, in entertainment yeah. very quietly. Yeah, he, it was right. Like he went, he became a Marvel superhero with a uh, thing with the raccoon. Guardians it's, of the galaxy. Guardians of the galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah it's yeah. funny. You said about COVID. I, um, for whatever reason, I had never seen Parks and Rec. And I burned through oh. the whole series over COVID. Yes. And I, it's funny. I, if you were to ask me now, I'd say that's maybe one of the best sitcoms ever made. But when I was watching it, the first two seasons didn't really connect with me. It takes then, them a while to get their wheels on. But once it clicked, man, did that thing click. And it was such a great show. But um, and once once it worked, it worked and I was all in. But for a while there, I was like, why does everybody think this thing is great? Like it, it thing. But um, but I'm glad I, I watched it. Yeah, that's one where there are some stories you can read because eventually they realized the conflict doesn't have to be will they won't they with the love stories. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like you can build tension and conflict without people being assholes and with and and without it being a breakup constantly on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And once they decided that everyone was like genuinely good and mm -hmm. the conflicts weren't going to be bad, they were going to be like ridiculous behavior mm -hmm. and there were going to be some you know, villains from the other, the, the other town. Um, but I think once they decided these are people who deeply love each other and once they find their person, they deeply love that person. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, I think that's when it really caught fire. And one of the best finales of like a show I've seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one, I think, one of the best, one of the standout episodes to me, and not just because it hits a bunch of my favorite Indianapolis favorite faves, but 
the bachelor party episode, um, I think is one of the most beautiful depictions of male friendship on TV. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, there's not a lot of, you know, there's a lot more talk now about toxic masculinity and how do you combat that? And I think that episode of them like playing catch on the Colts field, Mm -hmm. um, going to St. Elmo's for steak, um, or trying to go to St. Elmo's for steaks. Uh, it's just, I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful like ode to male friendship. So, you know, it's another great example of male friendship. And I don't know if this is even a popular show, but um, the show New Girl um, does such a wonderful job mm-hmm. of a male friendship. Um, four guys, one girl living in a loft, but Like, they're always there for each other. I think every male character, at least at one point, has pretended to be gay to help the other one get out of some sort of situation. They kiss each other. They hug each other. It's never weird. It's not, you know, no one's like, I don't know. I think male, like true male friendship doesn't get depicted very well very often. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think about, I I think there was also... Um. Oh, it just it was Adam Pally and Casey Wilson, the guy whose dad was on Mad TV. It was set in Chicago. Happy endings. I never saw that. Um, but uh, there was um. It came up recently in in something I was reading, and I and I just realized I'd never seen it. It was good. It's good. It's like, I think it went two seasons, maybe three. Mm-hmm. The writers, the writers were all from Chicago. Uh, but I, they, they were put on a soundstage that was a new, a typical New York soundstage. Yeah. So I had some problems with the depiction of Chicago in the show. Uh, and I would tweet about it and the writers were like, Leah, come on. We, <laughs> you know, like that one of the guys gets a food truck that he cooks on and like that's against the law in Chicago. You can have a food truck but you have to serve food Prepare. that you cooked off premise. Yeah. And they're always like on a there there's you know people sitting on stoops and like we don't have stoop culture in Chicago. We have decks and so there was some of those details that I was like a little too hard on them for. Uh but it's a really fun show. It's you know kind of a modern friends remix. Do you think they had your name um, on a piece of paper posted in the writer's room Mm -hmm. saying, we've got to do it for Leah? They were like, at Chicago Leah, she gets us every time. Yes. Yeah. W.W. Chicago Leah. Yes. (laughs) B. (laughs) What would Chicago Leah complain about this week? So we've got a big topic we're going to dive into, but I want to do a little mini favorite thing first. Uh, And that's how part of how this got rescheduled was you mentioned online that you during COVID really found a lot of comfort and curiosity in cooking videos. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, my God, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing, YouTube, but it's like a resource of almost anything you could imagine. (laughs) I um, I I've 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 always cooked, and and I don't know if if I was particularly good at it. I'd say I was a really really good cook, on like five dishes, and I had like five things that I could do, kind of with like one arm tied behind my yeah. back. But but you know like you're home and you can't go to restaurants. You know things. So I I wanted to get better at stuff, so I started you know just sort of casually watching some cooking videos and the more I sort of did like you know a deeper dive I found people that I really liked like their personalities mm-hmm. and stuff and 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 their interest groups and so it's funny um I'd say 20 years ago or 10 years ago I'm really bad with timelines and I wish I knew where it was I have every book I've ever read I've never get rid of books mm-hmm. and I, I'm, I'm sitting in my, my office and I'm staring I no exaggeration. I've got a, a rack of 
there's probably 76 boxes. Yeah. So like, you know, the last time I moved, I pack up all my books and I just never unpack them because I don't have space or shelving as much as I'd like. And yeah. the little bit of display area I have, I've just filled them up with new books. But in those book boxes somewhere, I was always fascinated with these books. Um, I bought these books like a long time ago about, um, I forget they were called. It was like um, lookalike or like, so I don't know, but anyways, it was like how to make Twinkies in your house and mm. how to make like how to make like popular things like at home. Right. Like how do you do a payway, not a payway, a PF Chang's lettuce wrap at home? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I always thought that was funny, but I never actually went through to do it. It was just mm -hmm. more of like the fun of like reading the book. And so I started, you know, doing some cooking things. And then I found on the, these two people that I really connected with on YouTube, um, a woman named Claire Saffitz. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She was on Bon Appetit, but she's no longer on Bon Appetit. And I understand there's some scandal and yeah. I didn't bother going down, but I like her as a person. I, I don't know what the whole story is with Bon Appetit, but her whole deal is she's just like this master pastry chef. And she would be like, okay, today I'm going to figure out how to make a Twix bar. But the reason Ooh. I, the reason I love her videos, besides the fact that her personality is like really like connects with me and she's charming and she's nice and she's fun. She does not know how to make what she's saying she's going to go out and make when she starts the video. So her videos are about seven days worth of trial and error. And once she nails it, she gives you the final recipe at the end. But it's Ooh. literally like she throws everything out. Like she's like, that didn't work. Like she's reverse engineering it in real time. She's cutting the thing in half and she's saying, okay, the cookie, she'll make a cookie. And she says, needs more butter, throws them all out does it again, <laughs> does it again. The chocolate didn't look right or it didn't set properly, throws them out, tries again. And like, she almost cries in every video. And you like, you see how passionate she is about it and how she wants it to be perfect and how frustrating the entire process of making anything is. Right. Like it's a very, very human video as opposed to a lot of these videos where it's like, best foot forward. I'm the expert. I know what I'm doing. She's the expert because she figures it out, but it's literally like, okay, today we're going to make, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups. And she just gets a bunch of Reese's peanut butter cups and figures it out. Like, obviously she's trained. She knows how to do this. But, yeah. So she's but it, looking but it at it, it. She's tasting it. She is, mm. she's like examining it and mm. then backing her way into it. But it may take her six times to get, the filling correct yeah. or four times of that. And there's something I really connect with because who hasn't kind of like, you know, figured stuff out on the job or, yeah. you know, sort of like, you know, talked about something that maybe they didn't know everything about. Um, Nobody, and on the other side about. of that, when you talk about toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's this guy called Sam, the cooking guy who I also really dig, but he's this overconfident, really great, you know, chef. He owns like a couple restaurants in San Diego, but um, his whole deal is again, and I, I'm so fascinated by things that I know. So he'll like, he'll teach you how to make, like, he's like, okay, we're gonna make Big Macs today, but better. Or mm -hmm. we're gonna make the Chick-fil-A sandwich, but better. Yeah. And it's, but he, he, he takes the real thing they're making and, and, and the thing that he, he, he won me over is um, he made filet of fish, McDonald's filet of fish, oh, which, which I so think is the good. best thing on the menu. It is top, mm. top two things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, he made this filet of fish, but he made it with like Japanese panko and mm. he like, he made like a different sort of sauce and he showed you how to make the buns, like the, the steamed buns. And it's like, I haven't done it yet at home, but that is literally the number one thing I want to make like as soon as possible. Um, just because I'm thinking he also, he, he, he made Big Macs the other day and I'm actually doing that Saturday night. I'm making, um, I'm making a uh, impossible burger Big Macs because I keep a kosher home. So yep. if I make them impossible, I can use cheese. Yeah. Um, 
but I'm, I'm like, I'm literally so excited to make these dopey Big Macs because like, I always thought that Big Mac sauce was just like, like Thousand Island dressing and like, 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 um, like, I don't know, cucumbers or pickles, but there's like, he breaks it down and it's like this whole thing and I'm excited. So these people have inspired me to try dopey stuff that yeah. just like, I don't know, just might as well do these things while I have no social life. That sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. Are they, uh, cause Burger King started, they do now like the impossible Whopper, mm -hmm. which I think has been a really good way to introduce people because cause now that I've had the Impossible Whopper, I'm like, okay, this is a reasonable facsimile of a burger to me. And my nephew moved in with me this summer um, and he's vegan. So like, could we get some Impossible Burgers and like do some fun, like a barbecue where like we're actually both eating the same thing. And it really opens the door to that. I am. Um, so I tried the Impossible stuff and I tried beyond it was mostly just so i could have like cheese on tacos mm -hmm. and things like that um and um and you know like the they're both fine for some reason i think the impossible in uh, in my opinion and it's all subjective yeah it's just a little bit better because for whatever reason and I, and i have no data behind it it's all just me bsing but it just like the impossible for some reason stays like as a burger better. So I think like, I'm just like it, it texture and perception and everything is so much of the experience right. that it, it makes it feel more real and stuff. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I will, hopefully you will post some photographs of your successful Big Mac outing on Instagram. I will. Good. Hey, Check it out on, on Saturday. <laughs> Cooking videos. That was our appetizer to the main mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. And so Saul sent me a number of, of ideas essentially ensuring that he comes back every season of the show because he yes. he is someone who has a lot of favorite things that go deep and are really interesting. But tonight we are talking about traveling and searching for collectibles while traveling. And, and I don't know if this is like adding on a, a thrift store to a business trip or if this is traveling specifically to go collectible hunting. And I'm so excited so we're talking traveling and collectible hunting and how they go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah, so I am, um, I love stuff, you know, like I, I, um, I, you know, in, in a perfect world, I would have, I'd live in kind of like a weird vintage toy slash sneaker museum. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I have stuff that isn't displayed and I, I'm, I'm modest in what I do display because um, I just, whatever, but I love the thrill of the hunt. So I, I collect sneakers and I love looking at, I collect sneakers, art and toys. And um, part of the fun of all of that stuff is just finding it. You know, yeah. it's almost like it, it's kind of like dating, you know, <laughs> once, once, once you're there, it's, it's almost not as fun as the chase. Um, <laughs> but I am um, before COVID, I, I, I was in a very fortunate position that I traveled, you know, two times a month for work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would tend to go back to the same places. I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, a lot of time in New York. Um, but, you know, Every now and then I'd pop up in Chicago or be in Portland, Oregon or Minneapolis and stuff like that. And I um, work very hard during the day. And, um, you know, at, at night I would either, you know, try to grab dinner with a friend, which I've done with you a few yeah. times in Chicago, or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, try your luck on Tinder or something like that. Um, but if all of that strikes out, um, I would just go like wander the streets and look for like stuff or whatever. And, and, and I would also always book one day extra at the end of my trip to go just like, you know, explore cities. Cause mm -hmm. you know, even though I, I, it, it's funny cause 
I used to always say to myself, you know, every trip, I'm going to just like treat it like I may never get back here again, never take mm-hmm. anything for granted. And then COVID hits and like, who knows, you know, what happens. So it's just kind of ironic and whatever. But, you know, it's like, I would, I would rent a car and drive two hours to see something really cool or to see like something rare or unusual. So, you know, we talked about Los Angeles, um, man, Los Angeles, if you guys are ever in Los Angeles and you like vintage toys, what I mean by vintage toys, the stuff that I really love, um, I love, um, the Adam West Batman show. Okay. I, I'm, I, I will buy anything that's associated with the show. Uh, I love Pee Wee Herman stuff. Um, I love the original Ghostbusters stuff. Um, what else? Um, so you, you know, lean August- in your in your toy hunting heavy mm-hmm. into nostalgia for your childhood oh, it's media. All, it's all the stuff that I love. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not necessarily buying things. I don't care if it's going to be valuable. I'm not looking to resell. I'm not looking to flip stuff or or anything like that. Like I have, um, uh, I, I've got my little toy shelf here that um, is just basically a Zoom decoration. That mm-hmm. if we were in Google Meet, you'd see it. It's a wider image, but yeah. Zoom doesn't let really you see it. But I've got, you know, like I've got Knight Rider stuff. I've got Batman stuff. Um, a lot of Adam West, a big boy. I'm a big fan of big boy restaurant and all their stuff and things yeah. like that. But, you know, it's it. When, when I say like hunting, like in L.A., there's this place. I will never go to L.A. without going and seeing um, Frank and Son. I, I know it sounds like Frankenstein. It's mm-hmm. Frank and Son. For those of you who are not familiar with Frank and Son, it's in um, there's so many little cities in LA. I think it's called the city of industry. It's near Anaheim. It's about 90 minutes from like downtown LA. It is the greatest single collectible show picture like Comic-Con, but it's a permanent Comic-Con that runs every Saturday and Sunday. So they moved into a former Costco. So I don't know what is a Costco 78,000 square feet. They're huge. Yeah. It's huge. So they took over a Costco and it is every Funko pop you could imagine. They have like, they have cool stuff from modern day to the last time I was there, somebody was selling an actual real McDonald land playground set, which (laughs) man, I would have, I would have bought that in a second if one, I could afford it. And two, like I lived locally and didn't have to worry about shipping that back. But like, there's like everything you could imagine from, wrestling championship belts to um, life-size statues of Batman to, you know, the most accurate replicas of everything. They had, they had a Ghostbusters um, Ecto-1 that's one-six uh, scale. So it was about 40 inches long by about 24 inches high. You need two people to like carry this or put on a shelf and it's like 50 pounds. So you look at it, it's the coolest thing ever. It's a little too nerdy for me. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've got, I've got an Ecto one die cast thing, but it's like, <laughs> it's like maybe eight inches long. I don't need a 35, 40 inch long one, but literally anything you could imagine. And here, here's the thing about my collectible hunting. Yeah. I don't need to own everything. For me, it's it's really like I treat some of these stores like museums. Mm-hmm. I'm very happy to soak it all in, take pictures, relive the memory, talk to the people who own the, the stores. Frank and Son is kind of like a, an indoor flea market, but they're more permanent fixtures. And it's it's way like for the way I picture it, these are their permanent locations. Whereas a flea market, it's a little more rustic and right. you know, whatever. But like, you know, it's the same thing in Chicago and Cleveland, Ohio. Um, there's a shop called Big Fun. Yeah. And it is, that's where I really got crazy about like this whole thing. Like, um, like they had original props from Pee Wee's Playhouse. They had Ooh. all the Pee Wee toys. They had, I was never really into WWF wrestling, mm-hmm. but there is something about that Hulk Hogan era that from my childhood. So they had all the, 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 
the soft rubber posable wrestling figures and all these things. And they had like original Knight Rider cars and they had all the Star Wars stuff, which I was never really into Star Wars, but I can just look and appreciate this stuff because I think it's really, really cool. And I, and I love that stuff. So, you know, it's the same thing with sneakers. There are some sneaker stores that are so interesting and so cool. In Boston, there's a place called Bodega. Mm -hmm. where if you didn't know it was a sneaker shop, you'd walk right by it. But they've pers purposely decorated the exterior of this store. To Do you know about Bodega? No, I'm imagining it. They've purposely decorated it. the outside of the store to look like a bodega. Yeah. But it's dirty and disgusting and gross. So you, so you would, would never go in. You would never go in. You open the door. And it is disgusting inside. Never clean the floors. Nothing. All the the, the cereal boxes are fake cereal boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, when they like on TV, they don't use brand names, so they right. just use like Circle O's or uh huh. All fake facade. At the back of the store, there's a like a Coke machine and a Gatorade machine. And when you walk up to the machine, you break like a sensor and it's like a it's like a an automatic door. The machine door facade actually moves. Whoa. And, and that's where the sneaker stores and you go inside and it's the cleanest and brightest and most beautiful sneaker store you've ever been. It's like a that luxury cool. little boutique store and stuff like that. And, you know, so. These stores are as much of the experience as like what they're selling. And I really love that. Um, I haven't been for years. I'm not even sure if they're still in business, but there used to be a sneaker store in New York called Dave's Quality Meats. And he, <laughs> he built a sneaker shop to look like a butcher shop Yeah. because when he took over the lease of the place, it was a butcher shop and it was just easier to leave everything in there. Sure. So he, he put sneakers in like the in the meat the, case, the meat cases and all that stuff and and things. So, um, but you know, like when it comes to like hunting for things, you, you talk about LA. You know, there's 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 a place called uh, Round Two, which is all vintage streetwear, mm -hmm. and like they've got literally. I walk in the store; it is my high school closet. They've got like the starter satin jackets yeah. and the, the NBA caricature t-shirts. The only difference is like the t-shirt that I bought for $15 now at, now at that time. Like 75. Is like, it's like 7,500 or a buck, a buck and a quarter. Ooh. And it's like been worn and washed 8,000 times. Right. And it's like gross. And it's funny. I love vintage toys. I'm weird about vintage clothing. I don't ever buy it, but I like looking at it. Yeah. Nike has got... They're like Nike throwback stuff that they're putting out right now. I'm not I'm not a Nike. I don't follow them, but I have never. This is the first time I've walked through a Nike section and I kept stopping and I was like, "Ooh, what are those like mm -hmm. parachute pants with cool colors and like the colors they're using right now. The color blocking at Nike is has I guess it gets me right in those Gen X like feels, which is the goal, mm -hmm. the, which is the goal is like find someone who's not going to go buy the vintage Nike or buy the vintage stuff and, and sneak them into our market. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, like I, I've always said when it comes to marketing and stuff, the two most powerful things are relationship with pop culture and relationship with just nostalgia in general. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and I think people are starting to get that, but you know, like it's, it's really interesting. Like, you know, as, as marketing has matured, you know, you, and I use the word mature, um, you know, loosely, because I think really it's become more about preying on people's um, insecurities and, and, you know, really delving too far into psychology. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, you know, like it, it's so interesting. You watch like, like Mad Men or something when, you know, like the, the whole idea of a soap opera was to sell soap. And that's why that, right. You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't like we're going to follow you around the internet for seven days mm -hmm. and, and pepper you with ads. But like, there used to be something really beautiful about, you know, like advertising and things and, 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 you know, like that is because it created an emotion and it created a memory. So, 
when I look at these things, like it really does take me back to a place. Whereas like, so one of my favorite brands is Porsche. I don't own one, but like if I could afford one, I'd buy one in a second. I've driven, guess what? I've driven it. I've done one test drive. They were, they, they had a RFP open. Mm -hmm. We were pitching. They were like, go this weekend, do a test drive. And it driving one Porsche for one test drive. So like 15 minutes Mm -hmm. ruined all cars for me. I'm going to say for two years, for two years, I, my body remembered. I was Mm -hmm. like, Oh, if I was in a Porsche right now. Mm -hmm. So So, go ahead. (laughs) Well, but it's funny you say that. Cause like for me, like, Yes, I want a brand new one because it's got all the bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. But man, you give me an 85 911, like, you know, it's like the car that, you know, it's like I could tell you it's like the car that I would see on the street when I was the most uh, influenced by car stuff mm-hmm. or, you know, show me the car that it, I'm going to say, show me the car that David Duchovny drove in, in California Cation, And that gets me really excited. Although, man, I watched the whole series of California Cation over COVID and that did not age well. Ooh. Some, some pretty loosey goosey, um, um, uh, thoughts around rape and homosexuality yeah it's uh <laughs> like even i'm like super like i can watch something and say well you know it was it was the time or mm-hmm. whatever but a couple moments even i felt uncomfortable watching yeah. some of that stuff but um but man you know like the you know it still doesn't change the fact that like you know that that corner of like you know from 82 to 89 were like you know, when I was really like, you know, it's like, man, like I, I'd love to, it was before I had my license. It was, this mm-hmm. it was like, that's, that was the, you know, people always talk about the the car that you had a poster on your wall. Well, I never right. had car posters on my wall. I think that's maybe a little, a little lame, but if I did have a poster on the wall, that would be it. So that's, that's what I still long mm-hmm. for now. So everything about this collectible stuff and it's really kind of like you know now that i i i I have my own money and i can do things it's almost like reliving every childhood fantasy i ever had there's it's funny there's a um there's a very very popular uh canadian clothing company called roots and they're they're all throughout the u.s too but in Mm -hmm. in canada roots is like the thing and uh, as a kid, my parents just never bought me root stuff because they they thought it was like overpriced stuff. And like we we weren't, you know, we weren't poor. We were comfortably middle class, but, you know, a little bit of just a responsible sort of spending habit. And as soon as I got my own money, it, it was like, you know, it's like, you know, as an adult now, like I have I have roots, custom roots leather jacket mm-hmm. with my company name on it and face <laughs> because it's like that thing you tell somebody they can't have it and it's like I'll show you. Yeah. So all my collectible hunting is all about kind of reliving my childhood. Like it's it's like when when I talk about Adam West Batman show, that was maybe the most important show to me um in my childhood because like I would run home from school to be home and watch it because it was on at three thirty, uh, like reruns and stuff. I'm not that old, yeah. But uh, you know, Adam West TV show Pee Wee's Playhouse was such an important show to me when I was a kid. And Pee Wee is still like, you know, I still admire everything about that. And and you know, Knight Rider and all these things. Like, I'm I'm a grown person, but all my favorite things are from a very, very specific time in my life. Yeah. And I don't think that's so unusual, but, but, you know, it's like, even like my favorite movie is Fletch and that's like right around that same time and all these things. And it's just, it's, it's funny to see how like, you know, one sort of like decade or half a decade can really form everything, you know, for the rest of your life, as far as like what you dig and what you don't dig. Yeah, it really locks in. It really locks into a certain part of your brain. And I was just last week on a podcast about Garfield, um, mm-hmm. which is a, it's the, called Hungry Cat Daily, and they have three times a week a fifteen minute podcast, and they're reviewing Garfield from the beginning. <laughs> and every episode is a new Garfield comic strip, and they're in nineteen seventy nine right now. That's amazing. And. But I was revisiting, I was looking at 
Garfield folders and fact checking myself about what were the cartoons that were on after school and Garfield and Heathcliff. And, and uh, it really just like looking at a few folders available on eBay, I was like remembering people I went to school with like that the door of Garfield like opened up a bunch of elementary and junior high memories. Mm. And I love that about that sort of stuff. So, so two things, one, basically you're saying my obsession with um, all these collectible stuff from a certain time period is I, I'm trying to live, relive the only time in my life I was happy. When you talk about country music, are you familiar with Red Sovine? No. Oh, so it's probably from like a hundred years ago. Red Sovine was like this like 80 year old white dude when I heard him. Yeah. And I heard him like 50 years ago. My dad used to listen to it. And it's like, it's like, it's just this like twangy guitar. And he would tell these like 19 minute long stories and call it a song. And there's two songs. One is called Teddy Bear, Mm -hmm. which anytime anyone's in my car, if they're like annoying me, I'm like, listen, I'm going to put on some music and I play Teddy Bear. And it's this song. (laughs) It's this song about a kid talking into a CB radio to all these truckers, Mm -hmm. but his mom doesn't want him using the CB radio because it's his father's CB radio. His father was a trucker, but his father died and he doesn't have a father anymore. And now he's trying to make friends with these, these so truckers. With the truck drivers. With the truck drivers. But he's in a wheelchair, so he can't go outside and play sports. So all he can really do is, is talk on the CB radio and it goes on for like 12 minutes Oof. and, and his, his CB radio name is Teddy bear and it's all the CB lingo. Come on back, Teddy bear and all this. <laughs> and then, and the song basically ends with the boy crying because the mom says he can't use the CB radio anymore. And 29 18 wheelers are pulling onto his street because they're all going to come hang out with this six-year-old wheelchair kid which isn't weird at all right they've they've got you know refrigerated goods in the back of their truck but they're just going to go spend time with the kid with no legs um (laughs) but the other red sovine song um, which I didn't know. So I used to always play the song as a joke because my yeah. dad liked it and it was just weird. Even as like a 13 year old, I knew this was weird. But um, I-, I told you I love Pee Wee. I was reading um, something about Pee Wee and I read that in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the whole large March thing mm-hmm. is from a Red Sovine song. What? Word for word about the woman dying in the thing. And it was 21 years to the day. So I've only heard two Red Sovine songs in my life. And I think they're all about dead 18 wheel long distance truck drivers. Wow. I can only assume. But the whole large March scene walking the bar saying, um, you know, I, you know, large March sent me and they go, what did you say? And they, the whole thing that the bartender says is word for word, this red Sovine song talking about Marge, the lady who, who ran her truck off the road kind of thing. That is out. That is an outstanding piece of trivia. There you go. Uh, I am, I am um, a wealth of unmonetizable facts. Yeah. So, Saul, I'm curious, when mm-hmm. you are planning a trip to it, so when you go to L.A., you've got Frank and Sons, and you've got Bodega mm-hmm. in Boston, and you've got Big Fun in Cleveland. When you're going somewhere new, how do you find the collectible hunting location to go to? Uh, so I, 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 I do, like, you know, lazy searches of, like, best sneaker shops, best, best vintage toy, you know, stuff like that. But they usually don't turn up everything, mm-hmm. uh, anything really interesting. 90% of the time when you put like best vintage toy shop into Google for like Minneapolis, it just because like SEO is so 
manipulative, um, you'll receive a response of like Toys R Us, which obviously isn't around anymore yep. and isn't selling vintage toys or FAO Schwartz or any yep. of these things. Um, sort of like he who has the gold, um, you know, makes the rules sort of thing. But um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll ask people on, on Facebook, I'll, you know, ping friends in the area. I'll look at, you know, great place to look for things are like alternative weeklies if they have stuff mm -hmm. online and and stuff like that. But, you know, like, you know, I, I just do a little research, you know. I, I think, you know, I know of at least one great sneaker shop in every major DMA, just because I've I've read so much and read all the top 100 sneaker shops and mm -hmm. things like that. But obviously, there's there's some places that are just better than others, like Vegas. Everyone thinks of Vegas for gambling and strippers and, yeah. and whatever. But Vegas has amazing vintage toy stores, like pretty much anywhere where the city is based around the concept of like disposable income, like uh, L.A. or whatever. OK, you find you find all this great stuff, you know, and, and, you know, like the other great place, flea markets. Oh my mm -hmm. God. The Pasadena flea market or San Francisco has an amazing flea market. Um, I love flea markets. Like I said, I don't have to buy, I don't need to come home with the mm -hmm. stuff. It's almost enough for me to just appreciate it and like see like the things and stuff like that. If something's really cool, I will buy it. But like, I feel kind of guilty buying stuff just to put it somewhere and not display it and, yeah. and, and things like that. But like, I just like seeing the stuff. So like, that's sometimes enough for me. Yeah. Cause I do know you as a sneaker head mm -hmm. and because often when we see each other at conferences, you have had a pair of sneakers customized for the trip. Oh, not for the trip, but just like uh, I, I'll maybe like you know keep them under keep them under wraps for a little while until people can see them. Yeah. Um. So how do you go? Do you have like what? Do you have some go to people when you're personal when you're personalizing sneakers like that, or how or how does how does that happen? One of the greatest sneaker customizers in the world, in my opinion, he's made a bunch of shoes for me. His name is Elon Bowman, but he goes by Eccentric Artistry. And it's spelled, because I don't think this is how you spell eccentric, E-C-E-N-T-R-I-K, Artistry. And um, let's see if he has a website. Eccentric one. Ooh. But Elon, really, really nice guy, super talented sneaker customizer. He does everything by hand. Um, he he does a lot of like animal prints and abstract design, but you give him an idea, he'll run with it. He's made me hounds two shoes where he hand drew every hounds two. He made me a pair of Pantone shoes where there's I don't know, 72 different color blocks on the shoe, all different shades. Um, just like a, a really, really good guy and very talented, um, you know, sneaker customizer. And and like customizing sneakers is a real art form because mm -hmm. it's not just like getting a plain white pair of shoes and painting them. It's about stripping the wax off them so the paint will stick. It's about treating them afterwards. So like his shoes are basically waterproof when he's finished with them. I've had a pair for a decade. They haven't faded. They haven't like anything like his. The guy is a real master at what he does. How, how did you come across him? Word of mouth in the sneaker world or? So one thing about me and, and you know, I don't know if this has become apparent from our conversation, but like I go out of my way to meet people that I really like. Mm -hmm. So like I wouldn't get on a plane just to go meet him. Um, but, you know, like he was in Philadelphia. I was in Philadelphia. So we had dinner and uh, he moved to New York. I was in New York all the time. So like we've probably had dinner five or six times. Yeah. Like, like I wouldn't say we're like super close friends. You know, I'm certainly not the guy who's going to call if he needs, you know, help with an immediate prom or something like that. But 
like he is a friend and like somebody who like I would I would do stuff for and try to help and and things like that and and you know it's like I, I I've sort of made a like that kind of my mission you know like I said before COVID I was lucky enough to have you know the ability to travel for work mm -hmm. and be all these different places so you know it's just it's important to go out and meet people because if you're not hunting for collectibles you're sitting in your hotel room doing nothing yep no i think you do you go out of your way you're really loyal and you go out of your way to like maintain relationships with people which everybody doesn't do well it's hard but it's important yeah as you know your second shot kicks in and travel comes on your horizon again. Mm -hmm. Are there some toys, some collectibles that you know about that you haven't seen in person yet that are like on your list in the next few years to try and that you hope, you know, when you head out, like what are some things that you hope you see as you get back into flea markets and collectible shops? So um, I don't know if you know these things called bear bricks. They're like no. these, like they're these like Japanese like vinyl toys that they, you know, they and they use like pop culture figures. So mm -hmm. there's like Batman and Superman and Mickey Mouse and and SpongeBob, and they're these like weird, crude looking vinyl toys, and they they come in three sizes. So one's like two inches, one's like twelve inch, and one's like almost thirty inches high. I was never really like into them because like they just didn't click with me. Mm -hmm. And I started reading more and more about them over COVID. I don't have any, I don't know if I've ever seen one in person. I probably have and just, they weren't important to me. So I never made a big deal about them, but um, these things go for like $4,000, $5,000. I've seen some for $30,000 and, and I don't get it. So I have no desire to go out and buy one, but I kind of want to talk to people about them and find out what the deal is. Yeah. They're, like, they're cool, but like, I don't get spending $30,000 for like a vinyl toy. So is this it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So like, like they're cool, but you know, like, that's a lot, a lot of money. So I kind of want to have like a real intellectual conversation about somebody about the phenomenon, because I'm probably more fascinated about the phenomenon than I am about the actual toy. Yeah, I, I have seen them like on Instagram and in my head, they were like all riffs on Keith Haring. For mm -hmm. some reason, I saw those and I thought they were like a Keith Haring derivative. So but they they're actually, not. There are, are they? Keith, there are Keith Haring, like, so they, so Bear Brick is not Keith Haring, but there is a Keith Haring Bear Brick. And, like, and there's an oh. Andy Warhol Bear Brick. And there is, so like, you know, they, they, there's, there's a Levi's Bear Brick that's just covered in denim. And there's all these things. So there's like, brand collaborations and artist collaborations and all sorts of stuff. And those are the ones that are more expensive and more rare and stuff like that. But um, like, and, and I'm sure there's people who think paying $600 for a pair of shoes is ridiculous. I just like, I want to, I'd love to sort of get into the mind of somebody who's into this. Cause obviously you have to be pretty wealthy and stuff like that. But like on, on eBay, like I was just, playing around with eBay and there's an auction right now that's over a hundred thousand dollars for a collection of like six of these. And it just seems like a crazy amount of money. Okay. So bare bricks are on, and I'm going to link to some of this stuff so that people can see it as well. So seeing some bare bricks in person, that's on the list. Um, is there anything from Adam West Batman or the Pee Wee Herman show or is there any of that, any of those collectibles that you're still hoping to run into in the wild? I, you know, I'd like if 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 you were to say where's the first place that I would go, um, you know, like uh, it, it would be Frankenstein's. Like it's just 
every time I go, I'm literally blown away by something. Like it's just, it you know, it's just it's it is it's it's like Disneyland for this sort of stuff. Like it's mm-hmm. the most wonderful, magical place in the world. Like Great. anything, any time period, anything that you're into, there is something for you. Like it's from Hello Kitty to you know, like not Hello Kitty. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's like to whatever the opposite of Hello Kitty is. Yeah, but like yeah. it's literally like there's you know, if there was ever like something for anybody as long as you're mildly interested in this sort of stuff. Yeah. And it's just like it's like a museum. It's just it's 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 wonderful. It looks it, pretty fantastic. I've been oh, oh, let go. Spidey, let go. You're fine. Let go. I was looking at some pictures doing a Google image search and it looks like those stalls are filled to the brim and mm. really diverse in what they're selling. And it's, it's like, you know, like when you think of like, you know, rare toys and stuff, there's a lot of things there that you could only get in Japan or you mm-hmm. could only get like a, like, um, so I like Funko pops. Yep. I wouldn't say like, I collect them. I just, I like them. Yeah. And uh, the, Last time I was there, I saw a Funko Pop for a thousand dollars. So I asked the guy, you know, what makes it so valuable? Like for me, I love talking to people and I love hearing like it's almost like I'm I'm as interested in the story behind things mm-hmm. as the thing. So um so the Funko Pop was a jolly bee. Do you know the the, the Yeah, the, the, it's a the Filipino Filipino fast chicken food. and yeah. yeah. So it was a like a jolly bee. B Funko Pop that was only available in Jollibee stores in the Philippines. Even though Jollibee is like global, this one was only available in the Philippines. Okay. And um, the guy said he had 10 of them and nine flew off the shelf in the first day. And like, you know, it's like thing like people, there's literally something for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Have you, you've pitched, surely you have pitched this idea to Netflix or someone, right? Where you host a show interviewing people that sell collectibles. So I did pitch a, uh, not to, not to Netflix, but I have, I've pitched two TV shows in my life and one, one got to almost a pilot stage and then all the money fell out of it. And the other one, just nothing ever happened. But um, the first show was called It's Saul or Nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, um, because I do like marketing stunts for a living, we we were going to um, basically find a small mom and pop store that like the the premise was if, if, um, Coca-Cola shut down Times Square to make this crazy spectacle stunt. It'd be cool, but you'd be like, oh, it's Coke. Like you sort of expect it. But what if a small regional mom and pop shop shut down Times Square? You'd be like, wow, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. So we were going to do these these big scale marketing stunts for small um, brands. And like it was you'd actually the show would follow you through the idea creation, the execution, and the results at the end mm-hmm. of it. And um, that was the one that got close um, and uh, got no money out of it, but at least I learned that um, making a TV show is awful. And the one that I didn't, <laughs> uh, never went anywhere, was kind of what we're talking about. It was going to be me taking you to like places like Bodega, like hole in the wall stores mm-hmm. that deserve like a little extra shine yeah. and, and stuff like that. And kind of like uh, support Main Street. But uh, uh, no one found that one interesting. Man, I think Main Street with Saul Colt would be so fun. Or, you know, like... I The... What are they called? They're not thrift fairs. They're fair markets. They're market. What's it called? The Sunday flea market. Flea markets. Yes. Man, my brain tonight. Saul is just like. Because I, I think there is something really fun to that. Um, we, How long has Antiques Roadshow been on the air? Yeah. and, and- Right. Like tw- we're interested in the stories of people and their stuff but i think the the seller 
I think, I think, I still think there's something interesting there. So. Well, but you think about it when you look at Shark Tank, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I don't know if there's four pitches per episode, three of them, somebody cries. Yeah. And it's, it's always like, well, my dad died recently and this is why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. When you look at America's Got Talent, it's those interstitials that hook you. Yeah. It's like, well, I grew up on a farm and we only had spoons to play with. And mm-hmm. that's how I learned to be a magician. Like it's it's without the story. And I know storytelling has become like this buzzword for marketing and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But like without stories, like nothing's that interesting. Yeah. You know, it's like the 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 whole idea of you know we talked about Porsche earlier you know you could go to the 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 German engineering or this or that but it's you know it's really about the story you tell yourself I need this car because I'm going to look more successful I'm going to be better at my job I'm this and then from the story you tell yourself other people develop stories like stories yeah. are very very powerful and yeah. you know it's like why are these people selling you know, Pee Wee Herman stuff and every Saturday and Sunday, why they decided this was interesting. Where do they get the stuff? Like, this yeah, is, I love all this stuff. Like it's, it's, it's like, it's so ingrained in who we are as humans. The first time I was on the show, we talked about, you know, my love of late night with David Letterman and mm-hmm. thing. And it's like, it's like, I could tell you, and I, and I did tell you, I liked this brand because I found them here. Mm-hmm. And I like this person because I saw them here. It's the same thing with all this collectible stuff. Right. You, know, you talked about the Garfield thing. I can probably tell you exactly what was going on in my life at every like sort of turning point for each of these four or five buckets of things that I'm most like fascinated by. Right. And, and, you know, like I just don't want to let it go and, and stuff like that. It's like, you know, it's like every, you know, every amazing relationship you've had, you don't, Mm -hmm. you don't want to let it go. And like these Pee Wee Herman was my friend when I was like nine years old, you know, it's like, uh, like Knight Rider was my, you know, friend and stuff like that. So it's, uh, I don't think people really give enough credit to how important, like, you know, fictional characters are to our um, mental upbringing, <laughs> our emotional yeah. well-being. Yeah. But also, when you think about specifically fictional characters, that then they become shorthand and touch points for people of the same generation. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, Saul, this has been a delight, as I knew it would be. Where can people find you online? What would you like them to? How would you like people to find you or listen to you? Or what would you like to promote? I'm, you know, I, I'm Saul Colt, S-A-U-L-C-O-L-T, no spaces, pretty much everywhere on the internet. You can find me. I do have a, my own podcast, which I've been really, really lax on putting out new episodes. I'm not as, um, I'm not as uh, uh, good as Leah about keeping a schedule. Um, but basically my show, it's called, we now join the program already in progress. It's just kind of like a long form interview with people I admire. It's just a reason for me to reach out to people. I I interview kind of like, you know, entertainment people, business people, artists, designers. I do have two episodes that um, I need to put up that I've been sitting on for a while, but I have a Jackie, the joke man, Martling from the Howard Stern show, who um, is a really fun episode uh, because Jackie is fun. And, um, and my first uh, returning guest was uh, Tim Stack, who is. um, I know that name. A character actor, Groundlings performer. Yes. Um, he had a, a show called Son of the Beach, and uh, as well as uh, Nightstand with Dick Dietrich, which again, a really, really important show for me in my high school years. It was basically a satire of the Jerry Springer show where they it was all <laughs> improv and they made it even more outrageous than Springer could have been. Um, but Um, Tim Stack has been in, he's been in Curb Your Enthusiasm, he's been in ALF, he's been in Golden Girls, he's, you know, working character actor for 40 years or so, but 
really just a wonderful guy and um, writer on shows like uh, Raising Hope and My Name is Earl and all sorts of things. So uh, Tim is somebody, you know, funny, uh, somebody who I just admired forever from watching him on TV. And I wrote him an email and asked if he'd come on my podcast because that was the literally the basis of my podcast was to give me a reason to reach out to people. Right who had no reason to talk to me. And uh, we kind of become like email buddies. And, oh, I and, love it. And, and, uh, and you know, he, he's been on the show twice and very, very kind to me and very nice and just a really wonderful person. So I will get around to posting um, those two episodes, um, I don't know, hopefully this week. They're all edited. I just need to literally, like, put them in, which I don't know why I haven't yet. <laughs> It sometimes I um, sometimes my episodes are released at midnight on Sunday, like at the mm -hmm. beginning of Sunday. My goal is by 5 p.m. on Sunday they come out. But there are definitely there was one week where like I missed it. And then I was like, well, it could be one day late. And then I was like, or it could just. So I've missed I've missed one week this year where I just like could not couldn't get it together. Mm -hmm. Um. But it it can be, it can be hard to keep up with, and it's and it is something that like as the world continues to reopen, that I'm gonna have to be very dedicated about continuing to make time to do. Well, here's the thing: putting a podcast up every week isn't hard. Putting a good podcast up every week is hard. Great. Well, Saul, this has been wonderful, and. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.